Hey there, and welcome. By the end of this video, we'll have something that looks a little bit like this. It can be used as a kind of impact or explosion effect, I suppose. So the first thing is I'm going to go to my assets folder and the meshes folder in here. I have a sphere mesh and this is what I'll be using. You could replace this with a sprite renderer inside of the effect if you wanted to. I quite like the fully 3D look of things and it's not going to be too performance heavy. So I will be using this simple spherical 3D mesh. Just for context, I will drag this into the world so we can see roughly how big it is. We can see if we hover over this, that we're getting a scale of approximately 42 by 40 by 40. So it's quite a small mesh here. By dragging this in, if I compare this directly to the standard sphere mesh provided, again, we can see roughly how big of a mesh I'll be working with. I think in comparison, the sphere is 100 units. The other thing you'll need to follow along if I go to the materials folder, I'll drop into the M underscore particle base. It's a very, very simple material. It's been set to a surface additive, as you can see to the left hand side here, meaning that we're only going to be passing in the emissive and opacity value. The emissive value is coming from the particle color node. So you can just create any one of these searching for particle color. And the emissive color is of course the color of the particle, which will be able to override in the Niagara system. And then this is being multiplied by an exposed parameter value named emissive strength. So if I navigate over to my M underscore particle instance, this is going to be the emissive strength here, just so that we can control just how bright this is. So we can increase this if we wanted. I think for this, just a standard value of one is going to be perfectly fine. We don't want really sort of glowing smoke or something. Okay, so the kind of preparation out of the way. We're going to go into the effects folder, very similar to any of the other content. If you've seen my other Niagara tutorials, we'll start by making an emitter. Remember that this just makes things a little bit easier if we wanted to reuse this for different effects. We will then have that emitter that we can plug in to other Niagara systems. So the emitters are these orange ones, systems are red. The red ones, the systems are the things that we can drag into the world. And the emitters, of course, we can't drag in, but we can use them inside of those systems. And the final thing, we will be jumping into this very soon. I'm using uh, 4.25. There will be a few differences between 4.26 and 4.25. So if something isn't quite working, you may need to do a little bit of research of what may have been renamed or just moving things around a little bit. Unfortunately, there's a weird, annoying transition between every different engine version. So just be aware of that as you are going ahead. But this should, for the most part, work for absolutely everybody if you just remember that not everything will be displaying exactly as I'm typing it. So what we're going to do is we'll right click in here, we'll create our effects and we're going to go to our Niagara emitter. From this option, we'll just start with a completely empty one. So we have full control over this as we go through. So we're going to go into the template and then use the empty template. I just named this one NE underscore impact. And then I think we'll just go kind of a top to bottom approach. So we can start with the emitter settings, if you don't already have that selected, make sure you select the emitter settings. The only thing here is I'll make this uh, determine this to be processed in local space. Then we won't need anything for the emitter spawn, but we will go straight to the emitter update. And just here we'll be controlling how we want this to work. So remember, it's very much a kind of single fire, one play type of thing. So we're going to change this immediately from the looping behavior of infinite to only play once. Remember the life cycle mode here, we're going to keep this as self. So if we do add this into a system, which may have a looping emitter on there, we're not going to force this to loop as well. We'll make sure that this is only kept relative to itself for how often it should play. And then of course, we're going to want to change this. So we actually have something spawning. So we're going to add a new node down here, or we can do so from the right hand side here. And we'll be looking for the spawn burst instantaneous. So we want everything to appear at the same time in a kind of bursting effect. For the spawn count, I'll set this to a value of 90. And the spawn time, there won't be any variation here. So we'll just spawn all of these immediately. And we'll kind of randomize them a little bit through lifetime effects and scaling. At the moment, we're just going to have 90 orbs in one place. Now, I said we're going to go top to bottom. There's one thing immediately here is that we're still using the sprite renderer. This is going to really affect how things look. So if we'll jump ahead a little bit now so that we have a good kind of idea of the updates and what they're doing as we go through. To do this, we're going to jump straight down to the sprite renderer. We'll remove this and for the rendering options, we'll add a new mesh renderer. Then inside of that mesh renderer, we want to make sure that we set this to be our SM underscore sphere. You can see the material by default is uh, not having anything applied. 
So we're going to tick this override material option. We're going to use that drop down here with the plus icon, and we're going to set this to be the M underscore particle instance. And there we go. So one thing I can see here that again is immediately too bright. So I'm just going to navigate to this. And it doesn't look as though it should have been that bright here. In fact, I know part of what the problem is. Uh, we could probably still tone this down a little bit. So I'll set this to 0.5. But I think this is brighter just because there's so many. There's 90 different particles all directly on top of each other, kind of multiplying that emissive value. So we'll leave that for now. We'll keep it in mind. But I think that should be OK. Next, then we want to control how our particle is spawning. So we're going to go to the spawn particle section. At the moment, we have the initialize particle module here ready to work with so we can make some changes here. At the moment, this is all very uniform. What I want to do is change the lifetime to be kind of random. So each individual particle will live for slightly longer or less time than the particle next to it. So what we're going to do is we'll use the drop down and we'll make this a uniform ranged float. And I'll make this quite a small variance. So we'll make this between 0.65 and 1 should be fine for the maximum. Then if we tick the position, and we're going to set this to be a uniform ranged vector for the position of the initialized particle. I'll set these values to minus 20, minus 20. So that's the x and the y for the minimum and 0 for the minimum value. And then for the maximum, we'll set this to 20, 20, and 5. We'll also need to make sure that we tick the position option here to make sure it's actually being taken into account. And then for the rest of the things, we can leave the mass and the color as they are. We can untick the sprite size, as of course we're not using the sprite renderer anymore. The mesh scale we can leave unticked, as we'll be controlling that uh, manually a little bit later. So at the moment we have a block of different uh, particles being spawned kind of in a very uniform shape because we have a kind of square bounding for the position. So what we're going to do is we'll add an add velocity node in the uh, the particle spawn here. Again, rather than having this be a very uniform value, we're going to randomize this just using another very simple uniform arranged float. And I'm not adding any offset to the z axis here. So what I'll do is I'll make this a minimum of minus 100 on the x and the y and a maximum of positive 100 on the x and the y. OK, so we now have those dispersing a little bit. The next thing we want to do is control the kind of shape of these. So to do this, I find one of the best shapes when trying things like uh, spheres and sort of circular radiuses, the best effect, for some reason, came from the add velocity and cone. So we'll be using that. I'll be adding a velocity strength of 800. We'll be damping this a little bit later with drag. Then the cone angle, I'm going to set to 180. And we'll keep the velocity distribution at 0.5. And then remember, at the moment, this is looking off because we have this set to the x axis. We want to change this to the z. So it's being calculated in a kind of vertical axis here. So we now have the general kind of shape that we're looking for. This is looking a lot closer to that final result. Of course, as I said, it's going a little bit too far. And we can still add some randomization to the scale to make things look a little bit more interesting. And adding that drag is going to give us that kind of feeling of the initial real kind of force of that impact and then the petering out of the force over time as the particles get a little bit bigger and disperse. So I think the most important thing, the thing which will really make this look as though we're getting to the end state here, is going to be that drag force. We're going to do this over time. Remember, we can't do some things when it spawns. We want this to be accounted for for as long as each particle exists, which means we're now dropping down to the particle update section. So we're going to add another module here, and this one will be our drag module. When we have this, I'm just going to set the drag force to 5, as I know this is a value which works pretty well for the end result. Then finally, because of the uh, the way that these need to be resolved, we need to make sure that the solve forces and velocity is after anything which is going to be affecting forces of velocity like drag. So we can either move this up manually, remember we can always change the order of these which will fix the issue, or if you're not too certain and you just want to let the system kind of fix the issue for you, we can always use this fix issue button just here, and that will really just do the same thing if you're still getting used to this and you're not confident to be moving things around just in case you mix up a kind of part of the process and a bigger particle effect. So we can see now that is looking a bit better. It looks as though we're getting a, a lot of force at the beginning and then it's slowing down and it's not going too far. It gives us that uh, impression that the impact is quite forceful at the beginning. Uh, a lot of velocity is being added there and then it's petering out, which is what we wanted. Now, the next thing I think that will kind of sell this effect is having a randomized look to the scale of the particles over their lifetime. So again, this is still whilst things are 
live in action. So we're going to do this again in the particle update. For this one, I'm going to use the scale mesh size. Make sure that you're choosing the scale mesh size, not the size by speed. And again, rather than keeping this completely uniform, I'm going to make this based on a curve this time. So we're going to add a little bit of almost like an animation to our scaling here. So the first way that you might think of doing this is a vector from curve. Just a small learning moment here uh, is if you did it this way, this again, like I said, would be fine. You have access to all of the three axes. Now you can see here that if I make things completely different on all of the axes here, you get some kind of weird looking shape sometimes. Now this is one of the times I think having a uniform proportion to each of the axes would be better than completely randomizing it. Uh, what I mean by that is at the beginning, I want the X, Y, and Z to all be either 0, 1, 2, whatever we're going to set this to. I don't want any variation between the different axes because we, then we get these kind of taller or wider effects coming. So instead of using a vector for this, because I know that I want everything to be the same regardless, instead what we can do is we can take this vector curve and we can actually drive all of the axes on the beginning and the end that we have down here from a float. So now that we have this as a vector from a float, so that means that you can see here when I just resetting this is pretty much what it was previously. But this time this means that we're driving this one value will be for the X, the Y and the Z. So if I make this two, then everything's bigger on the X, Y and Z to the unit of two. So what we want to do is again, we don't want this to be uniform. We want this bit to be the randomized part. So I'm going to drop this down. And the final thing is we'll make a float curve instead. So we're going to take the float from curve and just here, what we can do, you can see that is looking immediately much better. So everything is staying uniform. We're still getting those nice round spheres. We're not having any of that weird offset where you get that kind of taller looking object at some points. So the X, Y, and Z is starting at one and then all going down to animating down to kind of a zero and disappearing. So that also means that one thing that we did have just now is we were having that kind of pop out effect. We never really want particles to just magically disappear. So it's always going to be nicer to have them animating out kind of like this. So what I wanted to do though, is now that we have this one curve value to worry about rather than the three different ones that we needed to keep otherwise in sync, I'm going to add a new point here by using the shift and left click. And what I want to do is I'm going to zoom out a little bit here and just make this really big to begin with. So we'll start this at one, we'll let it kind of expand and grow, which I think again, kind of sells that initial force. And it also makes it look again like it's not going as far. And rather than having this looking quite so rigid, what I'm going to do is drag select all three of these different points. And then I'll right click on any of the points here, set this to auto, and this will add a kind of interpolation between these different values. And there we go. We can see that's animating into quite a nice big kind of plumy look of the, uh, the impact particles here, and then scaling back out to nothing. So at the moment, this is kind of purely white going into a transparent gray because of the material that's being used. So what I'm going to do is the final node I think that we can use here to make this really look more complete is adding some color over time as well. So we'll add a color module here. Then what I want to do is control two things separately. So rather than controlling the color and the alpha together, that can be a little bit cumbersome and a little bit confusing uh, and not quite as versatile as we might want. I think the alpha is going to be good going from the full value of one and then just animating over time down to zero with no kind of offsets. Whereas for the color, we might want to do things like adding a tertiary color in the middle somewhere or just sticking between just two is completely up to you. So what we're going to do is we're going to drive the color again, rather than being a uniform set color all the way through, we can control this using a color from curve. So to begin, I will make both of the opacity values here at one, as I said, we're not going to be driving this in the curve here. So we just set both of these to default to one. And for the color, I'm going to create a kind of lighter blue at the beginning, and then we'll lerp this to a darker blue by the end of this curve. Then to control the alpha, we're just going to use the float from curve that we've used a few times now. So we'll come down to the scale alpha. We'll choose the float from curve. And then as we've done here, I'm just going to zoom out again in the, like I've done in the past, grab both of these nodes and right click on one of these, and then just set this to auto. So nice and simple. And this is then just going to ease over time from a full opacity of one down to zero. And if you did want to, to have this easing off a little bit slower, then we can change the shape of the curve. And I think in fact, something like that looks a little bit better where it stays visible for that little bit longer before petering out. 
So looking at this now, I think maybe one thing that we could do is maybe go back to the size and just take this down a little bit. We're going way, way past two here. So that looks a little bit better, somewhere around about 1.5, 1 1.6. And that is pretty much the end goal that we're looking for. So the final things here, we will want to create a thumbnail for this. So remember that if you wanted to get rid of this background, we can go to Window, show the Preview Scene Settings, and over here on the right-hand side now, for the environment, I'm just going to untick the Show Environment, and we have that black background. That would have been easier, actually, to have tested and looked at things a bit sooner. Uh, we can then Apply and Compile, grab a thumbnail from this, and make sure that we apply and compile that again. That just means now when we're back in our view here, we can see our NE underscore impact has that thumbnail, so we know what it looks like. And then the final step, of course, we want to make sure that we can use this in the world. So we're going to right click on this, choose the Create Niagara System, give this a name, so I'll call this NS underscore impact, and we can just make sure we have this working as intended. And just again, to those of you new to the Niagara System, the reason that we're making this an emitter first and then a system is we can now do things like we can see we have one emitter here, which is the one we've just created and made this from. We can right click just here. We can choose add emitter and we can add in another NE underscore impact as an example. And what we could even do on this second one is remember how we're controlling the direction. We can go to the add velocity and cone. And let's say we wanted this to be a kind of more omnidirectional impact here or an explosion of some sort. Uh, we can change this from the one on the Z to one on the X. And what we have now is because we can reuse the emitters in this way, we have something looking a little bit more circular. Uh, we can add a third one to get the uh, kind of uh, diagonal explosion effect here as well. We could start changing the colors of the second one. And this is where that reusability of the effect system really comes into play. Okay, so with just a few very simple tweaks here, we have a kind of bizarre looking uh, system, but that's just a quick idea of what we can do with these and why we create things a lot of the time from emitters first and then turn them into systems. The other thing is we can now come back in here and say we wanted an impact when we play the sparks effect as well. We could add the same NE underscore impact into the sparks system and then have it there as well. For now, I think just for testing, I'm going to get rid of this. We'll compile and save this. Of course, we can uh, create a thumbnail for the system as well, just again, so that we know roughly what this is going to be when we drag it in. And then if we drag that in, we can simulate the play and we have the impact playing as we wanted. So that is how you could very easily create a stylized impact effect in Niagara. If you've enjoyed the process, find the information useful, then do remember to leave a like and share the video around to really help this reach as many people as possible. More than anything, I think it's getting those clicks into the channel, which is really gonna help the YouTube algorithm promote the channel as it's still growing, uh, unfortunately, fairly slowly. And I know that there are a lot of people looking for content like this. It just doesn't seem to be reaching them. And I will be making a lot more Niagara tutorials going forward, hopefully. So do leave a like, share the video around. That is greatly appreciated. And of course, if you do want to see those new videos as soon as they go live, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you wanted to get access to the end results of any of the tutorials that I go through, especially effects like this, then you can get access to those over on my Patreon site. Check the reward tiers available. I tried to make each tier as valuable as possible, as it's the support over on Patreon that is allowing me to keep making these weekly and hopefully starting to release more and more videos per week as side topics like this. So that support is greatly appreciated. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of the names scrolling down in the background here for your continued support over on Patreon for those reasons. As ever though, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.